Well, we've come to the point in our efforts here where it's be somewhat of a challenge not to become very emotional. You sang a song, I don't know if I've ever heard it before, Remind Me, Dear Lord. But obviously, meditating upon the verses, this song as we're singing it, and the refrain that says, Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from, where I could have been. Brother I, when I think about those words, and this congregation certainly comes to mind for me. Certainly comes to mind. That's what we've done on this week. We've been able to roll back the curtains and to be able to remember, man, what this congregation means means to us. Means a lot. Hi. Yeah, see faces here that, and we've known for so very long. It's been 27 years, brother Jerry, since we were members here. And see faces that we have known for so long, we love so very dearly. It's good to see them here. It's good to meet new brothers and sisters in Christ that we didn't know when we were here. Almost three decades ago. But it's certainly good to be able to have met you guys, to be able to spend the time together that we've been able to spend. Man, we have felt the love of the Second and Adams congregation on this week. So this congregation was one of the most loving congregations I've ever been around whenever we first got here. And then it's still, all these years later, one of the most loving congregations that I've ever been around. Some faces that are not here that we loved and cherished, man. Time goes on. Time goes on, and that's kind of what we'll talk about a little bit on tonight. Is God is good. Man, God is good. He's prepared a place for us. We know that we're not meant to be here forever. Peter would refer to our stint here as a sojourn. We call it sojourners. He would refer to it as a pilgrimage. We're pilgrims. We're not meant to be here to stay. Not meant to be here to stay. Man, we got bigger, bigger and better things in mind and in store for us. So Joanne, I, I remember we come down right before Brother Dan had passed away. We got to spend time with Dan. Dan was such a dear friend. And so we got to see him in the hospital, got to hold his hand, got to pray together, hug his neck, massage his shoulders. Such a dear friend. I think it was just a couple of days after we had gotten back to Florida that Corbin called me and told me that he passed away. And then it was a Sunday morning, and Larry called me. He didn't call me, rather. He texted me. I mean, Larry, you remember what you said to me in that text? Can you imagine what Dan is looking at right now? Wow. It's hard to preach that morning. It's hard to preach that morning. How good is God to us? And if this life that we live right here and right now is all that we have, then, man, it's really not worth living, just to be honest. But if there is something better in store for us, something eternal, something beautiful, something unimaginable, then, man, every breath that we take, every step that we take is absolutely worth it. It's worth it. And the beautiful thing about it, when we look in the Bible, the Bible tells us that, man, there is something ahead of us. God has been good to us in that he has prepared a place for us. When we begin to think about life after death, of course, we know there are so many different ideas out there. There's so many different philosophies or so many different ideals, different ideas about what happens. We know that Hollywood has had a proverbial heyday with what they think occurs after death, we remember movies like Ghost. I'm probably dating myself when I say that. That movie came out a long time ago. But Patrick Swayze and these kids don't even know what I'm talking about. But, but <laughs> that movie came out, and Hollywood wants to, to impress upon your mind, wants you to, to believe that once we leave this earth, when the body has been separated from the spirit and what James refers to as death, James chapter 2, verse number 26, then we are ghosts. And we'll be able to some way, somehow, maybe affect 
this life that continues on on this time side of things, but we know that's not the truth. Job tells us that once we leave this life, man, we have no more business on this time side of things. We're not ghosts. We don't come back and haunt anybody that we didn't like, and we don't come back and get to continue to forge relationships with those that we did like. It doesn't work that way. But that's what Hollywood ha would have you to believe. We think about Hinduism, and Hinduism tells you that there is something called reincarnation, samsara, they call it, this doctrine, and the doctrine that once you leave this earth that you come back again and again and again and again and you get reincarnated, and if you, you do well enough in the one life and you die, you get to come back and be reincarnated to something better than what you were, man. If you were a sorry person, lived a sorry life, maybe you'll come back as a toad frog or a rock or something but they teach you that you keep coming back over and over again, and, and it's just not the truth. That's not what the Bible teaches us. That's not what the Bible says. Islam says that when we die from this life, especially if we've been involved in some type of jihad or something like that, the holy war, and we've given our lives in, in, in an effort like that, that we get to go to a carnal, a very carnal paradise where there's a waiting for us, all the wine that we can drink and plush couches and 70 virgins and all of these types of things like that. That's what they teach, but we know that is a fantasy and far from what the Word of God has got to say and nothing that we would even want to be involved with. So many different ideas out there. If you are familiar with Mormon doctrine, they teach the doctrine of soul sleep. Once you die, then you simply cease to exist, that your soul sleeps eternally. We know if you are familiar with the Jehovah's Witness doctrine, they teach there are basically three different results whenever people die. If you are part of the 144,000, then you get to go to heaven. But if you're not, but you're saved all the same, that you'll be on an earth, a renovated earth that will stand forever. And then if you were a devilish person, if you were a heathen, then you just simply cease to exist. And of course, we know that humanism will teach the latter, that once we die, there's no spirit, there's no soul, there's no eternal realm we will simply cease to exist and of course that's what they certainly hope will happen as they turn their backs on god and the life that god has given them even though it's in him that they live and move and have their very being but what does the bible say tonight all that we're ever interested in all that we're ever interested in when it comes to any subject matter when it comes to any topic all that we ever care about hopefully children of god is what the word of god has got to say my friends, even in the Lord's body today, there are those who have deviated from the truth of God's word to begin to teach things like we're going to live on a renovated earth. Whenever Christ comes back again, the earth is going to be renovated, it's going to be renewed or restored, and we'll live on a renovated earth eternally. We'll be involved in all types of, and I quote, I quote, temporal endeavors. The word temporal refers to the things that pertain to this life, this, this, this time side of life that we live, the carnal aspect of it, the physical aspect of it. That's what the word temporal refers to. And I heard just very recently one of our brethren, a, a guy that was, is a very dear friend of mine, say that our existence will be temporal in eternity. And again, I've told him to his face, that's just not what the Bible teaches us. This is just not what the Bible says. But I'm telling you, there are a landslide of brethren who are buying into that doctrine. What does the Bible say? That's all that we care about tonight. What does the Bible teach us about life after death? What has God prepared for us? Well, we know that he has prepared a place for us, right? John chapter 14 and verse number 1 through 3. Jesus Christ is talking to his apostles on the night in which he's betrayed. And of course, they are down in the dumps, if you will, because he has reiter reiterated to them that my work here is almost done and I'm going back to the Father. And so they are not looking forward to, to the fact that Christ is about to leave them. He's become their friend. He, they've realized that he is their Messiah, their God, their King. And again, they're friends by this point. They've been together for three and a half years. Christ has been walking with them and talking with them and training them and being close to them. And so they've developed a love and an affinity one for another. And so they're not looking forward to the fact that he says, I'm about to be gone. But he says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to this to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. How comforting are those words. How beautiful are those words. Christ says, I am going to prepare a place for you. 
and I'm going to come again, and I'm going to receive those who are mine to myself. Where I am, they are going to be able to be also. And so we look so forward to that. Heaven. Heaven is that place the Bible talks about that God has prepared for us. Heaven is accurate. This is the first point I want to look at tonight. Our lesson tonight is not going to take long, and I guess whenever a preacher tells you that, you can take it or leave it. But uh, at least in my mind, Brother Rod, the, the lesson is not going to be long tonight. I think it's rather simple. I think it's pretty elementary. It's one of the reasons that it baffles me so much that right now in the churches of Christ, we're having such a dissension and a disparity of thought in regards to what happens to us in the afterlife because it's so simply set forth in the Bible. It's just simple. It's not hard. Heaven is accurate. You've got all these other ideas about where we're going to be and what we're going to be doing when this life is over and when Christ comes back again, but heaven is the accurate picture because that's the picture that the Bible paints for us. Can we go through a litany of scriptures tonight to make that very clear that we are going to be in heaven if we've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we've lived our lives faithfully in service to our Lord and his kingdom all the days of our lives until death, heaven is what the Bible says will be in our future. That's what the book teaches us. I don't understand how we get anything else out of it. People make a big deal out of this expression, the new heavens and the new earth. So we see that terminology in the book of Isaiah around chapter 65 and 66 mentioned twice. We see that terminology mentioned in the book of 2 Peter in the third chapter, and we see that terminology mentioned also in the book of Revelation. And I think every time that terminology, that expression is utilized, it means the same thing. Isaiah was looking forward to the next age. Whenever he used the terminology, look at the context of Isaiah chapter 65. He was a very messianic prophet, and he looked forward to the age of consummation, the Christian age, if you will. So he simply uses that expression to say that right now we're in the Mosaic dispensation, but there is another dispensation that is coming. Whenever Peter uses the terminology, he means to say the same thing. And whenever John in the book of Revelation uses the terminology, he means to say the same thing. There is something after this age that God has got in store for us. It's the next age is what's under consideration there. And it's apocalyptic language. Isaiah uses a lot of apocalyptic language. And so does Peter occasionally. A few points in his lessons, especially in chapter 3. And then also we know that Revelation is full of that, full of apocalyptic language. And so that's all that he means. Our brother get tripped up on that. And I think it's not because these are thoughts that we ourselves have derived, but we are listening to what denominationalism has got to say. Some of the men, and I know these men personally, some of the men that are most enamored with that idea and with that doctrine are men who's got their heads and their brains in denominational literature all of the time. I'm not telling you what I think. I'm not telling you what I've heard. I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you what I know. We've had these conversations. I know who they're reading. I know what they're looking at. I know what they're taking into their brains. And the thoughts that they're deriving don't come from the book, but they come from denominational scholarship. And we need to get our heads out of N.T. Wright and R.C. Sproul and all these other guys. We need to get our heads in the book. We need to get our heads in some John and some Peter and some James. And see what the God's got to say in his word. Heaven is accurate. When we talk about what is going to be our eternal future, if we've obeyed the gospel and lived faithfully, heaven is the accurate depiction of what that's going to be. How do you know that, preacher? Turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 5 real quickly. We know that Matthew chapter 5 begins the beautiful Sermon on the Mount. Whenever our Lord comes here and begins to minister to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and when he gets down to that last beatitude in verse number 11 and verse number 12, he says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward on earth. Yeah, I'm glad I'm seeing these heads shaking no like this. Thank you. Because that's not what the text says. Man, this stuff is not very hard. It's very simple. Great is your reward in heaven. The Bible says our reward, my friends, is in heaven. 
is in heaven. Fast forward in your Bible, same Sermon on the Mount, to chapter 6 and look at verses 19 to 21. And see what our Lord has to say to us there. What does he say there? He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and dust doth not corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. First of all, he says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and dust, dust, dust corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, in heaven where moth and dust doth not corrupt, where thieves cannot break through and steal. But where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. Man, some of these brethren, their treasure is right here on earth, and that's why their hearts are fixed here on earth. That's why they can't see heaven. That's why they can't fathom heaven, heaven as being the eternal abode of humanity who have obeyed the gospel and lived faithfully, even though that's what the Bible clearly says, is because their treasures, obviously, are right here on earth. They love temporal things. They've not set their affections on things above, like Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 2 says. They've set their affections on things here. When you read some of these false teachers who begin to talk about their thoughts and their ideas that we're going to live on, heaven, on earth eternally, man, they'll tell you what's on their mind. They'll talk about stuff like playing uh, rounds of golf in eternity. This is after Christ comes back again. They'll talk, talk about playing rounds of golf. They'll talk about playing football and being coached by the likes of Bear Bryant. And people like this, you kidding me? That's what you're looking forward to? That's what you're looking forward to. I mean, I thought we could do those things right now if we wanted to. I can go play a round of golf, brother, can't we? We can go play a round of golf tomorrow if we are so inclined to do so. I mean, it's too windy and cold around here, but, but we could do that if we wanted to, all right? Right here, right now in this life, I'm looking for bigger and better things in eternity, my friends, than golf and football. I love football, man. I'm a fanatic. But if that's what heaven is about, I'm not that enthused. I'm really not that enthused. The fact of the matter is that's not what heaven is about. So the Bible says, number one, our reward is in heaven. It says in the second place that our treasure is in heaven. That's what the Bible says. We go over to a place like Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, and the Bible will tell us over there that our hope, my friends, is in heaven. Look in Colossians chapter 1 and let me begin at verse number 3 and see what the Apostle Paul has got to say here. Here's what he says. First and foremost, he says, I thank my God, or we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have to all the saints. Notice verse number 5, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the truth of the word of the gospel, or the word of the truth of the gospel, rather. Paul says, Christians, that our hope is in heaven. I mean, does it get any plainer than that? That's explicit terminology. Does it get any plainer than that? Our hope is in heaven. Here you go to places like the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4 through 5. Paul says, look, there's one body, one spirit, just as you're called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God, verse number 6. But again, verse number 5, there is one hope, the Bible says. Whenever we have brothers and sisters in Christ who have bought into this idea of a renovated earth or a rejuvenated earth, you understand that you are teaching a different hope, another hope. I know that a lot of us believe that heaven is going to be our home. Why? Because of the verses that we've just looked at. So that is our hope. Now you got these other brothers over here that are teaching, no, earth is going to be our home. Have you not introduced a different hope? When the Bible says there is only one, that's a problem, my friends. I'm telling you it's a problem. And again, it contradicts exactly what the Bible says explicitly in so many different places. The Bible teaches us that our hope is in heaven in the third place, but in the fourth place, the Bible teaches us that our citizenship is in heaven. Look in the book of Philippians chapter 3 with me, verses 20 and 21. Our citizenship is in heaven. My friends, this needs to mean something to us because God wrote it. If you've got a King James Version, the Bible says, for our conversation is in heaven. That word conversation is from a word in the Greek language, politouma, is how you say that word, politouma. And what it means literally is citizenship. So if you have a new King James Version or maybe some other version, it says citizenship. That's what Paul intends to say. For our citizenship, 
Pardon me, is in heaven. For once also we look for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be formed or fashioned like unto his glorious body. The Bible says, whereby he's even able to subdue all things unto himself. Our citizenship, we're walking around on this earth. And again, Peter says we're sojourners and pilgrims. And that makes sense. And it coincides exactly with what Paul says. Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. It's in heaven. Not here on earth. You mean to tell me that while we're on earth, we're citizens of heaven, but whenever the earth is gone or whenever eternity is ushered in, we're going to be citizens of earth? That makes no sense. We're going from the greater to the lesser. And that's not really what God is about. It's not what he's got in store for us. He's got us going from the lesser to the greater, and you see that all over the scriptures. Go with me real quickly to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3 through 5 and and. Again, everything that we've looked at so far has been crystal clear. There's nothing ambiguous about this whatsoever. But when we go over to 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse number 3, go down to verse number 5, as Peter will, will introduce uh, himself and, and this letter that he's writing, as Paul does and, and other biblical writers, they will begin by giving accolades and, and veneration to God. And so he says, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his Abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To what, Peter? To an inheritance, listen to this, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fate is not away, reserved in heaven for you. Does it get any plainer than that? Reserved in heaven for you. Where is your inheritance? Reserved in heaven. This inheritance is incorruptible undefiled it's eternal where is it peter says plainly it's in heaven i sit down with a brother in christ and i'll tell you again here's a brother that i love very dearly i love him dearly and we sit down across from one another at a, a dinner table in knoxville tennessee both having spoken on the same lectureship a number of years ago and we begin to talk about this matter and he told me i I believe that we're going to be on earth eternally. Christ comes back. And I asked him, brother, what do you, where do you get that from? I said, what do you do with passages of Scripture like 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5? I asked him that. The Bible says that God has got in store for us an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, the faith not away, reserved in heaven for you. It doesn't get any more explicit than that. What do you do with that? This was his answer. God, honest, this was his answer. Well, our reservation is going to be in heaven, but we're going to be on earth. And again, I respect this man dearly, but with all due respect, that makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. With all due respect, it makes no sense whatsoever. And I've used this illustration, talking about these sorts of things multiple times. I'll use it again tonight. And that illustration is this. My beautiful bride, my anniversary is, is May, 5th, May 15th. May 15th. That's when we were married. <laughs> Say it again? Yeah, man, I, I had to, man. I just stumbled over that a minute. So, man, I, I hope you're hoping y'all didn't catch that. But I, I'm positive. I'm positive. It's May 15th. All right? Right, babe? <laughs> so, May, May 15th rolls around. And so I tell her, you know, say she's at home that day. She works with me, but say she's at home that day. And I call her from the office and I say, look, you know, big day. It's our anniversary. I've got a reservation for us at Texas Day Brazil. It's a Brazilian steakhouse, man. It's, it's good, man. Oh, man, if you're a meat eater, it's good. We only go there about once a year because it's so expensive. <laughs> but we're going to Texas Day Brazil. It's one of her favorite places in mine. Fancy restaurant, Brazilian steakhouse. So we got reservations there. Make sure you're ready when I get home at about 5 o'clock. Make sure you're ready, ready to go. And we're going, well, we've got reservations at Texas Day Brazil. And so I get home. She's all giddy. She's happy. She's ready to go. She's been starving herself all day so that she can put down as much meat as possible. Me, me as well. <laughs> so I, I get her, and we drive, and we pull up at McDonald's. Pull up at McDonald's. All right, baby, let's go eat. 
Let's go eat. You know my wife. You know her. And she's going to be looking at me upside my head. Like, what in the world are we doing here? You said our reservation is at Texas Day Brazil. Well, yeah, our reservation is there, but we're eating at McDonald's. <laughs> foolishness, man. I'm telling you, it's foolishness. Now, I'm telling you, it's embarrassing because this man is one of the most intelligent men that I know. He's got a Ph.D. He's very educated as well. Why would something like that come out of your mouth? Why don't you just believe what the Word of God has got to say? Why am I so wet to, why am I so in love with denominational doctrine that I would even sabotage my own intelligence to try to believe something the Bible simply does not support? The Bible says our reward is in heaven. It says that our treasures are in heaven. It says that our hope is in heaven. It says that our citizenship is in heaven. It says that our inheritance is in heaven. Why would we believe anything else? Heaven is accurate when it comes to depicting the picture of what is going to happen to the faithful saint in Christ when Christ comes back and eternity is ushered in. So heaven is accurate. Heaven is accurate. But in the second place, heaven is appealing. So what about heaven now? We know that heaven is the home that God has prepared for us. Now, what about it? What about it? It is appealing. I mean, when I think about what the Bible says about heaven, and there's plenty the Bible gives us by way of information concerning heaven, the eternal abode of the saint where God dwells, we know it's appealing because in the first place it's going to be a place of eternal rest. Turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 is going to be a place of eternal rest. Man, just like Brother Gant just mentioned a moment ago, and he was right. You know, it's Wednesday, gospel meeting week is a beautiful week, it's a good week, we get fired up about it. Man, come Wednesday, man, you're a little bit worn out. But Rod, I said a prayer uh, this afternoon, God, man, give me the strength to, to keep, keep moving here because I, I'm worn out a little bit, a little bit tired, teaching classes all day to my students via Skype and then preaching at night, enjoying the beautiful fellowship that we've enjoyed together. Man, it's, it's, it's good. All of that is good, man. It wears you out, though. So, so... What about heaven? Man, heaven is going to be a place of eternal rest. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, and verse number 13. And John says, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. John sees a glimpse into heaven, and he hears a voice, and, and the voice says, Look, Man, blessed are those who die in the Lord. That's what the end game is. That's what John is encouraging Christians to do in the book of Revelation is overcome 31 times some form of the word nikao, from the word from which we get our word Nike. Nike, it means victory. It means overcome. And so 31 times you have some form of that terminology. In the book of Revelation, John is encouraging us to overcome. Johnny Ramsey used to put it this way. The book of Revelation is about this. Overcome and you shall be able to come over. Come over to God. And that's exactly right. And once we overcome and we get to come over to God, the Bible says you get rest. We get to rest from our labors. And you guys are laboring for the Lord. And one of these days we get to rest. And so that's why heaven is appealing, man. We want to be able to rest, man. There's nothing that you want more at the end of a day of strenuous labor is, is to rest than to rest, excuse me. You just want to rest. And when we think about a whole lifetime of zealous, fervent labor for our Lord, man, can you not wait for the rest that is ahead of us? Man, looking forward to that. Looking forward to that. Heaven is appealing. Number one, because of the rest, but in the second place, because of the relief, because of the relief. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 21, and let's see what the Bible's got to say there. Revelation in the 21st chapter, again, John is given another glimpse into the throne, throne room of heaven. That's what's going on in the book of Revelation. I want us to start there, verse number five. Excuse me, verse number four. And the Bible says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is a glimpse of the church in eternity. And here's what happens. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there should be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying. 
Neither should there be any more pain for the former things have passed away. Anybody here ever suffer through the death of a loved one? Everybody here has. Everybody here has. Anybody here ever experience sorrow that broke your heart? If you're old enough, everybody has. Everybody has. Part of the life that we live. Anybody ever suffered pain, whether it be physical or emotional, psychological, whatever the case may be, ever suffered pain, ever felt pain? Absolutely. What are the things, Brother Ray, that are healing about heaven? Well, at least in part, man, we get relief from those things. Don't ever have to worry about them again. Don't ever have to worry about shedding another tear ever again. That's something I look forward to. Look forward to that. Heaven is appealing. Heaven is appealing because of the rest, and it's appealing because of the relief. But my estimation, maybe you think something differently, I don't know. But in my estimation, the most beautiful thing, the most appealing thing about heaven is what we read in the verses that precede verse number four in this passage. Look at what it says. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Again, John is describing a new existence, a new age beyond the one in which he at that time lived. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. The, the age in which he is living, he says, and the glimpse, the prophetic glimpse that I see, this earthly age is passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Listen to this. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. What is John trying to impress upon the mind? There's going to come a time in which we are right there in the very presence of God, and he is in our presence. I mean, right now there is a distance between us, God, between us and God that we cannot transcend. But one day that's not going to be the case. Can you imagine your Lord that we talked about on Sunday morning, all that he has done for you, all that he suffered for you? Can you imagine the day when you get to sit down at his feet right in front of his throne? And praise his name. Can you imagine that? The God that created us. The God in whom we live and move and have our very being. The God that daily loads us with benefits. The God that gives us every good gift and every perfect gift. The God that blesses us in ways and in measures that we cannot describe. And can you imagine the day when we get to sit around this throne Face to face, John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 2, we will get to see him as he is. Can't wait for that day. Cannot wait for that day. That's what, that's what I live for. That's what I live for. That is why I live. Can't wait for that day. So heaven is appealing. It's appealing. Not only is it accurate, the accurate depiction of what our eternity will be, but it's appealing. So many different reasons, especially the fact that we will get to be with our God. But in the third place, in the third place, heaven is accessible. See, if the Bible tells us all of the beautiful things that it does about heaven, but then we've got no right to it, we've got no way to access it, then it's all in vain. doesn't mean anything to us. But lo and behold, that's not what the Bible says, is it? The Bible says that we have access. Oh, we got access to heaven. God prepared a place for us. He prepared it for us. I always am very interested in, in people's thoughts and ideas in regards to hell and, and heaven but certainly mostly Jesus Christ. And here's what he says about, about hell. And we've talked about this before already. 
Matthew 25 and verse number 41, when he's painted a picture of the judgment for us and those who are the goat on the left, the wicked, when they have not clothed those who needed to be clothed, when they have not given drink to those who were thirsty, when they have not uh, visited those who were sick or in jail, when they have not sheltered those who needed to be sheltered, when they lived their lives in selfishness and greed and a lack of concern for others, and life is over, Christ says, I'm going to say to them, depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Who was hell prepared for? For the devil and his angels, not for you and me. Heaven is prepared for us, John 14, 1 through 3, which we've already looked at. Heaven is prepared for us. It is accessible. Christ says, if it were not so, I would have told you. In other words, I'm not going to lie to you. Christ cannot lie, the Bible says, Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2. It's impossible for God to lie. His word is immutable, Hebrews chapter 6. And so if he says that heaven is a place prepared for us, and you can take it to the proverbial bank, my friends. Take it to the bank. It is accessible. And God says it's yours for the taking. The end of his life, the Apostle Paul says in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 6, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. Look, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will give to me in that day, not to me only, but all those who love his appearing. That crown of righteousness will adorn our heads in the throne room of heaven if we live faithfully unto death. Heaven is accessible. God tells us about it because he wants us to long for it. It's available for anybody who wants it. Don't care who you are, don't care where you're from. Heaven is accessible. See, the Bible tells us how to make heaven our home. Jesus Christ is talking to those who have followed him faithfully when he says that I go to prepare a place for you. We go to places like the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and Paul is trying to make sure that he instills hope into those saints in Thessalonica who thought that maybe that if we have died prior to the resurrection, prior to the return of Christ, pardon me, then we've missed out. But he says, no, there's going to be a resurrection. And whenever Christ comes again, he'll bring with him those who have died in Christ already. Can you, can you envision that? Can you, can you see that in heaven? Jesus Christ and all the masses of those who have died in Christ and we are still alive when he, when he comes back again. And then the Bible says, if we are dead, then you know, we, resur we resurrect. We resurrect. We come back with Christ. And those who remain on earth, we will meet him, meet them together in the sky. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. We get to go and be with Christ and all of the saints, and we get to do so eternally. And again, who is Paul writing to? Those who have embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ, those who have obeyed God's gospel. We've already read the book of uh, of uh, Colossians. First Thessalonians says the same thing. Paul gives thanks to God for their faith. They've demonstrated to everybody, both in Macedonia and Achaia. These people have been faithful. They heard the gospel preach, man. We go to the to the book of Acts, chapter 17, and we see where Paul and, and Silas and, and others went into places like Thessalonica and preached the gospel. And these people embraced and obeyed the truth. There's our access to heaven. Whenever the gospel is preached, we've got to give a listen, listening ear. We talked about this on last night a little bit. The gospel is God's power to save us, and so it behooves us to listen whenever the gospel is being preached. Not the man-made doctrine, but to the doctrine of Christ. We listen. We give a listening ear. We take this word into our hearts. We believe it because it is the truth. You look at some of the atheists that exist out in our world, man, the ones that are running their mouths, Richard Dawkins and Bart Ehrman, and these guys are always yapping. They expect you to believe something that is unbelievable. Man, this is universe is the result of mere chance. There's a little bitty particle that would fit on the 
tip of a ballpoint pen. That thing exploded, and you got all the beauty and all the the wonder of the universe that you see. That makes absolutely no, no sense. You want me to believe something that makes no sense. No sense. As fearfully and wonderfully made as you are as a human being, they want you to believe that you came about by mere chance over the process of chance over the course of millions and millions of years. Evolution, you evolved from a monkey. They want you to believe something that makes no sense. We want you to believe that you were created by an intelligent creator that's higher than us, that transcends this world in which we live. That makes all the sense in the world. Design demands a designer. That's the teleological argument. Every effect has to have a adequate cause. That's the cosmological argument. If there is moral, if there are morals, if there's a moral standard, then there is a standard giver. It's the moral argument. It makes all the sense in the world. God simply wants us to believe what is true, what is verified, what there's evidence for, and what makes sense. We've got to believe the truth. And namely, that God sent his son Christ to this earth. Tabernacle in the flesh, suffer as a human being to become the sacrifice that was able to take away the sins of humanity. And when he died on that cross, God resurrected him from the dead the third day. The Bible says he walked this earth for 40 days. That enough time for people to see the evidence of his resurrection? We're talking about people who watched him on the cross die. The Bible says John was there. The Bible says Peter was there. The Bible says that Mary, his mother, was there. The Bible says Mary Magdalene was there. They were there. They were watching this. You remember Christ is on the cross dying, and he looks down at his apostle John and says, that's your mother, talking about his mother Mary. He's talking to people. He's communicating to people while he's stretched out on the cross of Calvary. And then he's resurrected the third day after he dies, these same people that watched him die, saw him, spent time with him for 40 days. You know that the strength, someone's word is built upon, or, or, or a testimony in court, rather, is built on the strength of two or three witnesses. It was that way in the Old Covenant. We read that in the Law of Moses. But you look at an American jurisprudence, and it's the same exact thing. You know, when you get over to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, there wasn't just two witnesses. There were not just three witnesses. There weren't four or five or six. Jesus Christ appeared to over 500 brethren at one time. And Paul says, writing in 57 AD, 24 years after this occurred, that the better part of them, the majority of them, are still alive to this day. You don't believe he re resurrected? Go ask somebody. There are more than 251 people still alive who saw him. Still alive. Go ask them. If it wasn't the truth, then Paul would have committed intellectual suicide by making such a claim. And it's very interesting you don't have anybody that refutes that. Nobody refutes him. It would have been easy to do if he were lying. God wants us to believe the truth for which there is evidence. God demands that we repent of our sins and that we confess Christ and that we are buried with him in water baptism for the remission of our sins. And if we will do so, he will add us to the church. And my friends, we live faithfully. We serve faithfully in this church all the days of our lives, just like you're doing, brothers and sisters, just like you're doing. Don't ever stop. Don't ever quit. Don't ever give up. Because if you do not, God says heaven will be your home. Heaven will be your home. Heaven is accessible to every last one of us. And I love you guys dearly, every last one of you. And it's been a pleasure to be here. And an absolute pleasure to be here. I know we're not far into this year, but this is a highlight of my year so far. It's going to be hard to beat. It's been good to be here. Keep on keeping on, my brothers and my sisters. Keep on keeping on. And heaven will be our home. The invitation has, has been set forth. You know what we have to do. If you're here tonight and you've never obeyed the gospel, if you've never gone through those steps, if you've never met those conditions, you can do that tonight. The water's ready. 
Your elders are ready. They'll facilitate your obedience to the gospel. If you're a child of God, keep on keeping on. How beautiful heaven must be. And if we could be of any assistance to you tonight, Brother Rod has selected a song. Once you come, as together we stand and sing.